Thanks for joining us for the message. We see this as the central part of our worship service. We'll have someone from our congregation read the passage and jump right into the text. Scripture this morning is from Romans 1, 8 through 17 in the ESV version. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I plan many times to come to you, but I have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Palestine, Ohio has certainly been victimized lately, hasn't it? The train derailment, the explosion and the ensuing pollution. When this happened, I remembered another story about, about Palestine, Ohio. It involves an eight-year-old boy who had a hankering for a cheeseburger. Eight years old. His problem was his parents had gone to bed. So uh, when his hamburger hankering wouldn't go away, he looked on YouTube for driving instructions. And then after watching those, he grabbed his four-year-old sister, and they piled into the, the family van, and they headed down the road to Mickey D's. Eight years old. Can you imagine that? Uh, when they got there, the uh, McDonald's people, when they ordered, thought they were being pranked in the drive-thru. Here's this kid's voice ordering. But they knew that it wasn't a prank when they pulled up to the window to pay for the... So they called the police. The police said he did a pretty good job. He navigated four intersections on his way without any problem. Made it right up into the drive through and through. Um, the police called his grandparents because his parents were asleep. And his grandparents came and got him. Uh, that little guy is Matt and my poster boy. We love burgers. <laughs> That little kid had a lot of gumption, didn't he? Eight years old. He also got a cheeseburger, too. <laughs> How do you approach life? How do you approach life? What is it that's uh, important to you? What is it that motivates you? What causes you to, to, to step out and to, to, to move outside your, your comfort zone? What is it that's important to you? Last time we saw how Paul's approach to life was defined by his relationship with the Lord. The, the implications couldn't have been clear. Who you are defines what you do. If you are a believer, you, you, you belong to God, you, you are his, and you are at his service. It's Paul's opening statement about what, what salvation is and, and what salvation is, is all about. About where salvation 
plays into our lives. Matt talked about the book of Romans. It is quite a theological treatise. Paul is writing about salvation to the church of Rome. Get the picture? Paul is writing about salvation to believers. Now my question is why? Why would Paul write this sort of thing to believers? Why would he uh, ad address the church about what salvation is and what it does. Why? That's a good question, don't you think? Could it be that they don't really get it? Oh, now wait a minute. Think that through. Believers who don't understand what salvation is or what it does. What their faith is all about. That's quite a thought, isn't it? Addressing believers about salvation. Today's text, verses 18 through 17, it, explain, it, it expands on Paul's initial thoughts with, with how this motivated ministry. If you are his and you are about his business, if salvation is alive and working in your life, what does it look like? What does ministry look like? According to this passage, it involves three principal things. It involves prayer, it involves personal involvement, and it involves the power of the gospel. Three things. Prayer, the opening section, uh, verse 8. First, I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how I constantly remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. Paul understood that ministry is founded on prayer. He wants the believers at Rome to be aware that, that he loved them. He wanted to be a part of their lives and that he was praying for them. Did, did you get the word there? Constantly. Constantly. That's the word that's used. Paul's prayers for the believers at Rome weren't some slipshod, uh, some casual thing, something interjected when there's time, something if he happened to remember it. No, his prayers were consistent and concerted. I read about a, a Quaker who overheard two laymen talking about his, his sermons, the directions they had been, his sermons had been taking lately. And, and apparently, as he says, one of them felt quite satisfied with himself, where he was in his, his walk with the Lord. He, he, he said, I suppose the pastor will give another altar call this week, calling for further commitment in our lives. I'll, I'll sure be glad when he finds something else to talk about this pastor says that the other fellow's response sent him on his way with a song. Well, I hope our pastor keeps preaching the deeper walk with the Lord. I want more and more of him. When I get to heaven, I don't want to have to pull out my wallet to show the Lord my driver's license to prove who I am. I want him to know me by the sound of my voice. Which of those two categories do you fit in? The one who wants the pastor to back off, to, to, to lay off, or the one who wants a deeper, more penetrating walk with the Lord? Paul's in that latter category, isn't he? 
The Lord knew the sound of Paul's voice. He, he was continually at the throne of grace, seeking the Lord's face, seeking his will, seeking his involvement, seeking his intervention, seeking his power in his life. Prayer is the clearest evidence of a relationship with the Lord, a, a living relationship with the Lord. If you love the Lord, you will be interacting with him. You will be talking to him. You'll be voicing your desires, your, your, your hurts, your, your inmost thoughts, your, your gripes, your complaints, your love of him, and your praise for him. Sure, prayer can be problematic. Everything in their brother piles into our lives. So this week, I had my windshield on my truck break. We had a kitchen sink that uh, wouldn't unplug. It took four plumber's visits to get it fixed all week long. Prayer can be problematic, but that doesn't excuse us. If you love the Lord, you will be praying. If you love others, you will be praying. And nothing is going to stop you. Not stopped up sewers, not truck repairs, not tiffs with your wife. We didn't have a tiff. <laughs> that, that was one thing we didn't have. <laughs> 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 This brings me to the second of these three things, that ministry is motivated by personal involvement. I, I want to be personally involved with you, honey, <laughs> and, and not tiffing. <laughs> ministry is motivated by personal involvement. Verse 11, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I may have a harvest among you just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greek and, and non-Greek, both to the wise and the foolish. And that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. One of the things we stress here at Valley Church is the necessity of relationships. We were created for relationships. Ministry is founded on relationships. Ministry is all about creating relationships, first with the Lord and then with those in his church. That's what the gospel is all about. Relationships. Look again, verse 12. That is that you and I may be what? Mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I like that, don't you? Mutually encouraged by each other's faith. That's ministry. That's what the Lord has called us to do. You see, we don't get together just to get happy, to have a, a fun social time. If that happens, that's great. But we're here to minister to each other. Ministry is something deeper, something far richer, something far more satisfying, a, a, a walk of faith, a, a walk of accountability, an obedient walk with others in the family of God. Faith, as Scripture knows it, is always corporate. Now, scripture knows nothing of this individualized faith that's so prominent in our world today, or at least in our society today. An individualized faith. I know what I believe, and 
I don't need anything else. Scripture knows nothing of that. Faith, as Scripture portrays it, is always corporate. And yes, it requires instruction. This too is interpersonal, an interpersonal aspect of our faith. We need each other. We need each other to, to, to grow in our faith. One fellow wanted to minister in the worst way. He was a, he was a new believer. He kept pastoring the, pestering the Lord to pestering the pastor to uh, be of service. He wanted to do something. He, was, he wasn't well educated. He was rough around the edges. But his heart was in the right place and he wanted to minister. So the pastor gave him a list of ten people saying that uh, these men are members who seldom attend service. Some are prominent men in our, our city. Contact them any way you can and and get them to be more faithful. Use the church stationery if you'd like. Uh, write them letters, but get them back in church. This fellow was excited. He, he jumped at the opportunity. Uh, about two weeks later, a, a, a letter arrived from a, a prominent physician who was on this list. And in the envelope was a sizable check and a note that said, Dear Pastor, Enclosed is my check to make up for my missing offering. I'm sorry for missing worship so much, but, be, but rest assured, I'm going to be present every Sunday from now on and will not by choice miss services again. Sincerely, M. Jones, M.D. P.S. Would you kindly tell your secretary there's only one T in dirty and no C in skunk? Paul desired to minister with all his inadequacies. Paul had inadequacies. We probably don't think of him that way. But he had shortcomings. But he was motivated to touch others with the joy of Jesus Christ, to be, as he describes it, mutually encouraged. Ministry works in both directions, doesn't it? You, 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 you can't help somebody uphill without getting closer to the top yourself. Paul frames his desire to serve with enthusiasm. Uh, the, the texts use words like how he, he longs to be a part of their lives, how eager he is to be a part of their lives. Uh, to quote Edward George Earl bulwer Lighton, boy, that's quite a name, isn't it? Nothing is so contagious as enthusiasm. It moves stones. It charms brutes. Enthusiasm is the genius of sincerity, and truth accomplishes no victories without it. How many of us enthusiastically seek to minister to others, to be a part of their lives, to encourage them, in their walk of faith. This is your and my calling in Jesus Christ. It was Paul's calling, but it's, it's your and my calling as well. This is what we are to be all about, to change people's lives by mutually encouraging them. Paul frames his desires with something else too. Not just enthusiasm, but also look at verse 14, obligation. I am obligated, Paul says, both to Greek and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. This is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Catherine Ann Porter says this in an article she wrote. I am appalled at the aimlessness of most people's lives today. 50% don't pay any attention to where they are going. 40% are undecided and will go in any direction. Only 10% know what they want. And even all of them don't go 
towards it? Are you going towards where you ought to be going? Or are you aimless? Are you, you wandering? Blindly hoping that your life will amount to something. Your, your ministry will amount to something. This is one of the things I found most invigorating in the previous text. Paul had a clear understanding of who he was and therefore what he needed to be doing. Believer, if you want God's direction in your life, you need to know this. It will center on ministry. You as a child of God are obligated to minister to others. This is one of the areas that that today's church is most lax. Words like obligation and uh, accountability are almost always applied in the second person. They're they're very seldom uh, applied in the first person. We expect others to be obligated. We expect them to be accountable. We expect them to be faithful. But somehow of ourselves, we're pretty relaxed. We're pretty laid back. Ministry is born of obligation. It's fertilized by enthusiasm, and it's reared in personal involvement. The last point, ministry finds its power in the gospel. Do you have confidence in the gospel? Enough faith in the gospel that it literally sets the direction of your life? Paul voices his confidence in the gospel. Verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the the what? The power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. What a statement, huh? The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Why? Because it's the power of God for fixing what's wrong in our lives. Because... It's it's the power of God for fixing what's wrong in our world because it's the power of God for fixing what's wrong in our lives. You mean, preacher, the the power is not in my good intentions? You mean, preacher, the, the power is not in my sincere efforts? You mean, preacher, the the power is is not in my glorious heritage? Did you know that my grandfather was a pastor? and My folks established this church, helped establish this church? You mean, preacher, the, the, the power is not in my willingness to give financially? You mean, preacher, the power is not in my baptism or, or the church I'm a member of? Paul had confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ because it alone grants righteousness to unrighteous sinners. Verse 17 is the the key verse of the whole book of Romans. If you want to understand Romans, you've got to understand verse 17. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Salvation is a question of righteousness. He's he's writing to believers. He's writing to the church of Rome, and he's talking about what salvation is. Salvation is is a question of righteousness. Our our relationship with the Lord is a question of righteousness. How can a fallen, depraved sinner have a relationship with the righteous, holy God of heaven? That's the big question. The important question. The question addressed in the gospel. How can a sinner lost 
in his or her depravity have a relationship with the righteous, holy God of heaven. God who is holy, God who is righteous, cannot tolerate sin in any form. How can a sinner have a relationship with the holy God of heaven? You and I, as uh, descendants of Adam, have no righteousness of our own. We're, we're born in sin, which we prove as we live out our lives, don't we? We're completely unrighteous. Righteousness becomes ours only when we believe on the righteous one, Jesus Christ. How do you come, become righteous? By faith in Jesus Christ. The, the theological word here is imputation. It's one of those big, beautiful theological words. But it simply means to uh, credit or to, to put to one's account. The righteousness of God is imputed to us, credited to our account on the basis of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There are three imputations given in Scripture. Uh, one, Adam's sin imputed to all of his descendants. We don't like that. It seems unfair. But, you know, as we live our lives out, we prove that that's exactly what happened. He was the head of the family, and as the head of the family, what he did affects us all. The second imputation involves the cross. Our sins were imputed to Jesus Christ on the cross. This is, this is how Jesus became your substitute and took your wrath from God because your sins were given to his account. Your sins were imputed to him. The third imputation is what we're talking about here. Christ's righteousness is imputed. It's credited to the believing sinner. So when God sees us, he doesn't see us in our sin. He now sees us in Christ's righteousness. Much of the book of Romans revolves around this basic concept of righteousness, imputation. That's the gospel. Christ's righteousness imputed to the believing sinner. And this is why Paul speaks of it as uh, the, 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 the power of the gospel for salvation. This is why Paul had absolute confidence in it. This is why he was willing to commit his entire life to it. It is the gospel, a, a gospel of power and a gospel of purpose that Paul preached. You see, if the gospel is worthy of trust for life hereafter, it's also worthy of trust for life here and now. If it's going to change our direction there, it should change our lives here and now. This is why Paul is writing this to believers, to change their lives here and now. It's worth setting the direction here as well as the direction there. Who we are determines what we do. If you are a believer, you will be praying. You will be personally involved with others. And it all centers on the gospel of Jesus Christ. A, a British soldier during World War I lost his heart for battle. He was in the foxhole. It was wet. It smelled. No hot food. He'd been there for months, and he lost his heart for battle. So he crawled out of the back side of that foxhole. And he crawled across, away from the battle lines, the front lines. And when he got far enough away, he started to walk. His goal was to find the French coast in a boat back to England. His problem was the night was pitch black. The only light he could see was behind him as the, the explosions flashed. He couldn't really see anything, and he wandered aimlessly for hours. And finally, he happened upon 
uh, a roadside signpost. In his exhaustion, he leaned up against it and sat there on the ground for quite a while. And then it dawned on him, well, if this is a signpost, perhaps it'll tell me how to get to the coast, where I am and where I need to go. And so he shimmied up the signpost. When he got to the top, he couldn't see anything, so he struck a match. And there he was looking squarely into the face of Jesus Christ. It wasn't a signpost at all. It was a roadside crucifix. And there in that match-lit moment, the soldier remembered the one who had sacrificed himself for him. The one who had endured so much on his behalf. The one who had never turned his back on him. And he slid down that pole and again rested against it as he, he thought about his situation. And after a while, he stood up and he made his way back up to the trenches and down into that foxhole and continued the battle. In the gospel, Paul had a, a face-to-face encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, an encounter that, that reordered his life. This is true of you and me as well, isn't it? In the gospel, we've had an encounter that changes everything about our relationship with him and everything about our relationships with one another. And it takes us back to the opening proposition, doesn't it? Who you are defines what you do. If you are a believer, you belong to God. You are his. And you will be about his service.